I mean, I think the biggest myth is that um, older workers won't benefit your business, um, that they are they are too slow, they're too expensive, they're too fill in the blank, whatever whatever comes to mind to you as that stereotype of, of they're too cranky, they're too, you know, whatever it's going to be. Um, that that uh, is a myth, that there's lots of good research out there now that shows all the benefits of older workers and that um, investigating their use or their role within your business or your company is definitely a worthwhile investment. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Expert. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we are always here to help. Now, today we've got a, another great uh, guest on the podcast, uh, Corinne Amon. And uh, Corinne or, uh, is going to talk about a, a few things, including uh, ages, ageism and uh, discrimination against older work uh, workers um, and uh, how uh, people that are over 55 are often the most successful workers. And uh, also talk a little bit about um, how to, the opportunities to uh, br or bring uh, older workers uh, into or, or for older workers to bring different skill sets in your business, including uh, mentoring younger workers, customer service, and uh, also uh, de probably just de stigmatizing a little bit about uh, how older workers can learn new things or how they can or oftentimes uh, outshine the, or learning a, a new and different skill set. So it should be for a, a great uh, interview. And with that much as a introduction, welcome on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. <sighs> Absolutely. So. Well, I just gave a uh, kind of a, a quick introduction to some of the, the topics that we're going to be chatting about. Um, but for those, and just as a reminder to the audience, so uh, Corinne um, did uh, was a guest on our uh, other, uh, our, our sister podcast, The Inventive Journey. So if you haven't had a chance to uh, go check out her episode there, definitely invite you to do so. Um, but for those that uh, haven't had a chance to catch up or catch up on the episode or just looking for a quick introduction, uh, take a minute or two and just uh, or give a, a little bit of background, introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. So um, I run a company called Choice Care Navigators, and that is geriatric care management. So I'm working with older adults and their families to help them kind of navigate the healthcare system. Um, and through that work, I have had the pleasure of meeting and working with many, many older adults who have really surprised me in the things they are doing in their life, um, new jobs, starting nonprofits, volunteering, just giving back to their community a tremendous amount. And um, the thing that, you know, really, I, I've worked with older adults for 20 plus years, and I realized that if I was surprised by the older adults I was meeting, that a lot of the world might be surprised um, at the older adults that are out there and what they are doing and capable of, because it's really the opposite of what a lot of our stereotypes um, tell us older adulthood is going to be like. And so that's how I've kind of gotten into the topics we're going to talk about today and writing my book that that came out that deals with a lot of these issues as well. Awesome. Well, sounds like uh, definitely a, a lot of uh, great experience and uh, background and uh, looking forward to a great uh, conversation about all the, the topics that uh, you did hit on. So with that, so I think one of the things, you know, maybe in no particular order, but, you know, there's, I would, I would anticipate, uh, you know, earned or not, warranted or not, and I'm, I'm sure that you have the position not warranted, um, that there are some stigmatisms with, you know, people that are further along in their career or older in age. In other words, hey, whether it's they're going to be retiring soon, they're looking to make an exit, they're not going to stick around soon, they, they don't, they're not update on technology, they, you know, maybe are, are, aren't able to learn new skill sets or things that are outside of their wheelhouse. And, you know, I, I, you know, maybe people have had their, everybody's had their own experiences, but a lot of times there's some, you know, but there are things baked in that uh, assumptions that may, or a lot of times uh, may not hold true. Uh, so maybe just uh, walk us through a little bit. What are some of the, you know, how do you address some of those concerns or, uh, you know, 
um, biases that, that people oftentimes have as far as um, people that are, you know, older in their career or, or, or increase in age versus some of the other uh, candidates that they may be looking at. Sure. So I'm going to, I'll touch on a couple of things you said there, um, that they're advanced in their career, probably let's talk about people, you know, fifties, maybe even early sixties. And there is this stereotype that people won't learn or that they're not up to date on technology or that they don't want to learn things like that. And what we actually find when we look at research on people in this age group is often that it's not that they don't want to learn. It's that their employers are making assumptions about them, that employers who look at a 50-year-old or a 55-year-old start to make assumptions about, oh, well, they are going to want to retire soon, or they don't really want to learn new stuff because they're close to the end of their career. And so employers actually stop investing in those older workers without really having a discussion with that older worker about, hey, what are your plans? When are you thinking about retiring? Do you want to keep working? Do you want more prof professional development? Do you want to learn this new thing? So employers kind of have that implicit bias that, hey, this person has one foot out the door. So we're not going to invest in training them anymore. And then it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because the older worker didn't get the training. So they don't know the new technology or they don't, they didn't get the promotion because nobody even considered them because they just made that assumption that they're already done. Um, so I think our the biggest thing there is for employers to have an actual conversation with your employee to say, hey. We know that you're kind of at this stage in your career. How, you know, what do you want? Do you, are you thinking you want to keep working? Are you interested in professional development? Are you interested in that next promotion? Or are you thinking, yeah, I'm going to be done in five years or whatever it is so that we can actually have an honest conversation about what you want for your career and how, how you see that moving forward uh, rather than kind of just making assumptions without ever having a conversation. No, and that makes perfect sense. And, uh, you know, I'll, now I'll push back and they're playing a, a bit of devil's advocate, not that I necessarily agree with it. But, you know, I think that, and this would be the same whether or not you're farther along in your career or you're, you know, newer in, 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 uh, in your career. But, you know, oftentimes the tendency is for people to tell those that are managing them what they want to hear. So if I'm a younger employee, I'm going to say or tell my employer, oh, I plan on working here for the next 40 years and working my way up. Even if I'm currently searching for a job that pays more, I'm not going to necessarily tell my employer that. And same thing if you're to take the opposite end of, hey, I legitimately plan on retiring in the next three or four years. But I know if I tell my employer that, that they, it's going to hamper, you know, potentially hamper my ability to be with the company for the next two or four years or to have any growth or, or pro progress during that period of time. So I don't know, is there any ways to, you know, address that or to, um, to uh, look at that issue or to, you know, because I agree with you that, you know, having that open conversation and you'd hope that the employee would, but, you know, human nature is to tell the people what they want to hear, not in a bad way, but just to, in order to, can maintain your position and not to hamper, you know, your career and your aspect or different aspects. So any thoughts on that? You know, I, I hear what you're saying about telling somebody what you think they want to hear, but it's just that what you think they want to hear. Maybe your employer's mm -hmm. having this conversation with you because they would actually like to send you to some professional development for that next new thing that's coming out and they they want to know so are you interested in learning this and that's a genuine question or maybe your employer is thinking boy i really hope they're going to retire because i want to hire somebody else that has a different skill set or whatever it is i mean i i think there's a big assumption there about what your employer wants to hear because i'm not sure every employer has the same um outcome in mind when they're having that conversation. You know, one employer may be really hoping this is a valued employee and I hope they never leave. And somebody else may be thinking, you know, I really would like to re-envision this role or have a different skill set. And I'm really thinking this person, I'd like for this person to exit because I'd like to to re-envision this position. You I, I just you just don't know what somebody's actually thinking. 
on either side. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's absolutely a good point. And, you know, the, the assumptions that are, are baked in on both sides oftentimes uh, prove incorrect, but people just assume that it's going to be, or, you know, there's one perspective or, or one way to, to view it. And oftentimes you create, you create issues that may be non-existent. So, so now kind of, you know, going along those lines of shifting gears slightly, one of the, or a couple of the other things, that, you know, one that you already touched on and one of the other things you mentioned is, you know, people that are 55 and older are oftentimes the, the most successful workers and kind of going along with that, you'd also, when we chatted a bit before, you mentioned that they oftentimes will bring additional or different skill sets and skills to the business, um, you know, just to, that uh, may be, you know, lacking or, or not there with uh, other other potential candidates. So maybe give us your thoughts or walk us through kind of what are some of the skills that they oftentimes will bring and also what, what makes them uh, oftentimes the, the most successful workers. Well, so there, there's this stereotype that older workers, you know, aren't as good in different ways. Um, lots of times when I talk to people, they think older workers miss more days because their health is poor. And that's actually not true. Younger workers are a lot more likely to miss work because uh, their kids are sick, things like that. Um, older work, So older workers tend to be more reliable in terms of showing up for work on a day-to-day -day basis. Older workers have different skills that younger workers can develop. It's not that they you know, can't develop these skills, but that a lot of them don't have because of the technology and things they've been raised with. And that would be like customer service skills, people skills. Um, one of the advantages of older workers is they haven't grown up with texting and email and all those things. And so they know how to talk to people. Uh, there was an interesting study with, um, employees who were, this is a little bit old because it's back when you really had to make a phone call to um, make a hotel reservation. And when that, when they had like older pe workers who were taking those reservations, they found that the older workers took longer to make a reservation. The younger workers could do it faster. But when they actually followed up and said, okay, of the reservations that were made, how many of the people actually came and stayed at the hotel. And what they found was that the reservations that the older workers made, they had a much higher percentage of people who actually came and stayed at the hotel as compared to the younger workers. The younger workers reservations got canceled a lot more. And the reason for that was because the older workers took the time to listen to what the person wanted, make recommendations about what hotel and what kind of room and what amenities so that the person really got that personal touch and exactly what they wanted in their reservation versus a younger worker who's just making a reservation, right? Doing it as fast as they can, not taking that time for that customer service experience. And I think that's a great example of the difference that you can see and kind of, yeah, fast isn't always the best. Um, sometimes those people skills are really important. There's also um, a gentleman named Chip Conley who wrote a book here a few years ago called Wisdom at Work. And he talks a lot about the benefits older workers bring, but he uses himself as an example because he retired from the hotel industry and he ended up going to work with Airbnb when they were first starting. And he's very clear that he didn't know anything about startups or apps or any of that. But what he did know was the hospitality industry. And so he describes his work in that situation as a mentor. So he was a mentor to the guys who were developing Airbnb because he could teach them about the hospitality industry and the things you need to be thinking about but he was an intern because he was learning everything about startups and apps and you know development and all those kinds of things. And I think that's a great example of the kind of synergy you can bring when you've got older workers and younger workers together who have different skills. You know, it's not the same skill set. And so, but eat, it's not like the older workers are teaching the younger workers everything or vice versa. It's that we each have different things that we can bring to the table that actually make a much stronger package in terms of the outcome than just having older workers or just having younger workers. No, I think. 
I think that uh, that makes uh, perfect sense. And you know, I think having that that mixture and uh, a different uh, skill sets that can uh, be brought to the table uh, definitely can make a lot of sense. So now, kind of to, to follow up on that, and again, I'm just kind of uh, hitting on or some different uh, things within the, the topic. You know, there is a element, you know, within I'd say a, a decent amount of the community. As we touched on, that there may be ageism or discrimination against older workers. Um, you know, and I don't know that it's always, you know, intentionally. Hey, I'm going to try and, you know, I'm going to pick on them because I think they're terrible. It's just, you know, you have some, as you said, biases. Maybe you think that they're going to take more days off, even if that's not warranted, or you think, hey, they're going to be slower, and I need someone that's with it, or they're going to be able to learn technology better. And so, you know, if you have, if you intentionally or unintentionally and hopefully unintentionally kind of bake that into uh, oftentimes the, the culture or kind of you know how the things are often perceived uh, any thoughts on the way that you can maybe recraft or to adjust the business um, to provide that you know maybe a, a better opportunity to leverage a lot of those skill sets well i mean there's definitely age-friendly workplace practices that can be put into place that benefit both older and younger workers. So this would be things like when you're hiring, not putting things on your job ad that say, you know, you must have 10 years of experience or you must be, you know, a new college graduate, right? Like kind of eliminating those kinds of requirements on your job ads, you know, on your company website, making sure that you have um, pictures of people from diverse age ranges. Um, when we talk about, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and lots of times that's talked about in terms of race and things like that, which is appropriate. But age should also be something you're thinking about in terms of that diversity, again, because of the benefits of having those different skill sets and viewpoints brought into it. So um, websites, job ads. Um, and then when you're designing a workspace, then thinking about the different needs of the workers that you're trying to hire. So um, BMW is you know, a German company and they realized many years ago that their workforce was aging and being on the plant floor of a BMW factory is a physical job, right? It's labor intensive, but it's also highly skilled and they did not want to have a whole bunch of their employees retiring all at the same time. So they did some um, rearranging of their production lines and they created what they called the pensioners line, which was like the people who might be getting ready to retire, the older workers. And they designed it specifically so that it would be easier physical labor, right? So instead of working like at one workstation all day long, eight hours a day, they made it so that the workers rotated. You worked so many, you know, a couple of hours at a station that was very arm intensive and another couple of hours at a station that was very leg intensive and another couple of hours at a station that was like brain and made you think um, intensive. And the, ro the workers rotated through those and they found that it worked great. Like it was so much easier on the older workers' physical bodies um, and that actually became the most productive line in their factory, such that like the other workers in the factory kind of joked, you know, oh, that's the old people's line, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. They were the most productive and BMW actually switched all their other lines to implement that same process because what was good for the older worker was actually good for all the workers. And so you know, I think sometimes we think, oh, we don't have to make adjustments for, for an older worker, but what's good for them might actually be good for your entire workforce in terms of those adaptations. I think that gives some uh, great insight. It's, uh, you know, things that you might be considering, ways that you can uh, approach uh, both uh, setting up a uh, a work or a working environment that, that provides uh, the benefit to the employees, but also uh, or gives them the, the greatest opportunity to, to be successful. Now, you know, as with, you know, kind of, I would say across the board with all, you know, as you're looking at candidates of any age demographic or otherwise, they're oftentimes red flag. So, you know, taking example, someone that is brand new to the workforce, they may be have a red flag that they, have, you know, 10 years of experience on the resume, but they graduated from college two years ago type of a thing, or, you know, that they are 
saying that they have all these skill sets when they are unlikely to have been able to acquire those or do those many projects, you know, that are along those lines or anything of that nature. When you're looking at it and considering kind of, you know, some of the red flags, and, you know, or or the opposite. I don't know the opposite of red flags. So I will call it white flags. So I don't know what they are. Um, you know, what are the things that as you're looking at, if you're saying, okay, I would like to leverage, you know, some of these, you know, the successful employees, I like to be able to um, have the different skill sets and, and have some of the different de or age demographics within the, the workforce. Any red flags as far as things that you should be looking at to potentially avoid or vice versa on what I'm calling now white flags, because I don't know any better term for it. Um, you know, things that you're saying, hey, this would make for a good employee to add to the workforce, you know, as they, even if they may be of a different age demographic than we're typically used to. Any anything, any thoughts on either side? Um, I don't know that there are any particular red flags. Um, I think I would go with green flags as the analogy, like <laughs> go signals rather than <laughs> white feels like surrender. Um, but I mean, I think it's about the fit, right? It's about the comp the role and the company fit for that individual. Um, you know, one of the one of the things I think that companies often think is a red flag with older workers is salary. They think that if somebody is older, they're going to want to come in to a position at the exact same salary that they were making when they retired or, um, you know, whatever, if they've been out of the workforce, that kind of thing. And again, this is a conversation worth having because the research actually shows that most people, some older people are going back to work because they need money. And, that, and so salary or pay is very important. But a large portion of our older workers, if they've been out of the workforce and they're coming back, um, people won't interview them because they think they're going to want too much money. But for the older worker, it's not so much about the money as it is, I want purpose in my life. I want you know something to get up and go do. I want to feel valued. Yeah, the money is great and I'll, I'll like that. But they're often willing to work for less than they made when they were working full time, they may only be interested in part time work um, because they, you know, they're not looking to go back to a 40 hour work week. Um, they often don't need benefits because they may already have Medicare or they may have um, other care, you know, medical care through their spouse, things like that. And so there are a lot of green flags in terms of, you know, the advantages of having that conversation with an older worker and not just assuming, oh, they're going to be too expensive. They're going to want that same salary that they wanted, they had when they last retired, because there's a lot of things we get out of work. Um, that purpose that I mentioned before, social interaction, a feeling like we're giving back to our community or that we're valued and that what we do matters all of those things come from work too. And a lot of our older workers are looking for those benefits as much, if not more so than an actual big paycheck. No, I think that's a great one. You know, and I think that is oftentimes, you know, you do have the, the where you're, where you're concerned that, Hey, you know, they're, they're going to want to make as much as they did when they were working as a top executive, at, you know, company X, Y, and Z. And I'm sure that, you know, there are some people that have that expectation, just like a younger worker, if they were moving positions, they're going to say, hey, I want to uh, maintain my salary. I don't want to take a step down. But you or just as you said, it sounds like, you know, a little bit of a consistent theme is that, you know, making the assumptions about anybody in the workplace, including people of, uh, you know, that are, that are um, increased in age, uh, maybe one where it, it's one where that may hold true and they may have that expectations, but that just, as you said, there are other mo reasons and motivations that may be, uh, or considerations that may or prove that those assumptions don't hold true. So I think that's definitely a, a great, uh, or, you know, area to hit on. Um, well, I think that one of the, or the other thing that you'd hit on, you know, so mentoring, shifting gears a, a bit again, you know, I think that, looking at the opportunities for the skill sets that every employee brings in, including those that uh, may be of increase in age or, you know, be a 55 or, or 60 or 65 or whatever the age may be is mentoring younger workers, you know, customer service you hit on any other ones, you know, that are skill sets that maybe inherently come with age or experience or doing this for a longer period of time that you can say, Hey, here are, things that I can or look to leverage or look to incorporate into our culture that will be beneficial to the business. Any other ones that uh, come to mind that uh, people should consider? 
Well, the, the only other thing, I, and I think it's related to the customer service piece is a lot of our, as we age in general, we tend to get better at understanding other people <laughs> and interpersonal relationships, interpersonal interactions. I think that maybe is especially true um, for that younger people struggle with that a little more um, because of all the texting and the being online all the time. I, I have four kids and my oldest is 17 and he's really got his first job this year where he really has to interact with the public. And, and he would tell mm -hmm. you very clearly that that has been a really big learning curve for him because he has to talk to people, right? This is the first time in his life that he's really been in a position where he has to go, he has to talk to strangers. He's working in an ice cream shop and he's got to like, you know, get their order and scoop their ice cream and do all, but his boss has been really great about teaching him customer service skills. And that is just not something that he really has any experience with. And, and we've really had to talk to him about how valuable that is for him because it's not something that he has and he's really, he's been really uncomfortable with it. I mean, I think he would tell you that that has been the hardest part of that job for him is figuring out how to talk to people, how to talk to strangers um, and really have that customer service interaction. And so <laughs> those interpersonal skills that we develop as we grow up and as we start interacting with people, your older workers are going to have a lot more of that in general, not everybody, right? They're still going to be people who don't have good interpersonal skills, but in general, they're going to have a lot more of that in part because of their age, but also in part because of the different generations and the experience that young people are having growing up now where they just don't interact with other people except online and maybe at school like like we did when we didn't have that option, right? Like I, if I was going to communicate with someone when I was growing up, I had to at least pick up the phone and talk to them. And they don't even have to do that anymore. They'll, they just can, you know, they text, they do social media. They don't actually have to have a real life conversation all that often. And that's a really different experience than your older workers, your, your middle-aged or your older workers have had. No, I think that's a, a great uh, point to hit on. So now one of the other ones, and, and probably, you know, I'll say one last uh, kind of topic or item before we kind of wrap up with the, the final question, I'd like that wrap up each episode. But before that, you know, I'll shift the gear slightly again. And, you know, these are biases that may or may not uh, be, you know, true, but nonetheless, you know, sometimes they're out there. Um, you know, you'll also sometimes have, on the flip side, you'll have, um, yeah, customers that may have those biases so in other words you know i'll give make a, a made up example but you walk into a restaurant you go to order and you say oh i've got the old person you know in quotes and i'm not or whatever that age is to have you have you defined old but you know sometimes that's great like hey they'll give me great customer service and they'll you know listen to and, and give me some good or food recommendations or the other side is Oh, they're going to be slow. They're going to forget my order. They're going to take forever. And I'd rather have someone that's spry and will get, you know, the order in and out. And so how do you, on the flip side, if you're looking at customer facing, you're trying to help to set a culture that customers may, you know, address to some of their perceived concerns, any thoughts on how you might go about incorporating that or addressing that from the, the customer perspective? I mean, I think we all have, built-in age bias because we are we, we all exist in this kind of age biased culture where youth is is worshiped and and none of us want to grow old because we, the reason none of us want to grow old is because we see how people treat older people and we don't want to be treated like that but the only way you aren't going to be treated like that is if we all kind of stop and pause and consider our age bias and start treating people differently that's my soapbox. But to to your point about like customer service, I I'm not sure there's much you can do there in terms you can't control your customers' individual biases and what they think or they don't think. But I mean, I think the same thing could be true in terms of getting a really young worker, right? Like you may you may get somebody who's really young looking as your waiter and you may think, "Oh my gosh, this person is going to be an idiot because they're young," right? It's that that same sort of perception, um, I'm not sure it's avoidable because we all do have age bias, 
but um, I'm personally, I don't think that as an employer, you can't control that about your customers. You got to hire people that work for your company and serve your company well. And if you're, if you've got somebody who, who you know doesn't want a particular waiter or waitress, then maybe you try to make sure they don't get that person the next time they come in. But you you can't control those kinds of things in terms of what your your customers buy sees. No, I think that's a, that's a fair point. And you, you know, to the degree that things that you can control and things that you can, you know, uh, make you, or each customer feel or feel as they're taken care of as, as greatly as possible. Great. To the other degree, you know, you're going to just have to, to work to, Hey, if they're a great worker, they can do things. A lot of times, you know, I'll go back to the restaurant example. They can still show that, Hey, they're going to do a great job. You get great service and food comes out quickly. And oftentimes those assumptions are, are quickly overcome as people see that they are, they're erroneous. So I think it's uh, some great uh, items or uh, topics to hit on. Well, now as we kind of uh, wrap towards uh, the end of uh, this episode, I always like to uh, wrap up with, uh, or with one question and I've, we've already hit on a lot of it, but uh, we'll hit on this one nonetheless, which is, you know, um, within your industry, what is the biggest myth and why is it wrong? Yeah, you're right. We've we've hit on this. I mean, I think the biggest myth is that um, older workers won't benefit your business, um, that they are they are too slow, they're too expensive, they're too fill in the blank, whatever, whatever comes to mind to you as that stereotype of of they're too cranky, they're too, you know, whatever it's gonna be. Um that that uh, is a myth that there's lots of good research out there now that shows all the benefits of older workers and that um, investigating their use or their role within your business or your company is definitely a worthwhile investment. Awesome. Well, I definitely, or as we already hit on uh, throughout the, the episode, it's a great myth to dispel, a great one to learn from, and uh, it provides a lot of opportunity to uh, build and or build your business and, and leverage a lot of the, the op- or a lot of the different skill sets and uh, and different uh, things that uh, p- our people can bring to the table. Um, so with that, now as we do wrap up the episode, if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? So um, I have a website, which is corinneallman.com. That's C-O-R-I-N-N-E-A-U-M-A-N.com. And through that, you can um, purchase my book. You can find all my social media channels and you can send me a message directly through there as well. Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage people to reach out, support a great business, uh, make a new connection. If nothing else, uh, make a new best friend. So mm-hmm. with that, thank you again for uh, coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you, their listeners are out there. If you have your own journey to share and you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, we'd love to have you. So just go to um, inventiveunicorn.com. Apply to be on the podcast and or our uh, recently launched uh, webinar series as well, Inventive Fireside. Um, definitely love to, to have or have the or a variety of guests on those. Um, and uh, also, uh, if along your journey you ever need help with patents or trademarks or anything else with your startup or your small business, uh, just go to strategymeeting.com. Grab some time with us to chat, and we are always here to help. Well, thank you again, uh, Corinne, for uh, coming on the the podcast and what's the next leg of your journey? Even better than the last. Thank you.